year of my life, that's almost 52 years so far, the world has become a worse and worse place. Today's guest on Nature Bats Last is former host, Professor Guy McPherson. Guy, welcome back to Nature Bats Last. Are you there, Guy? Okay, we'll wait and see what happens, and uh, hopefully Guy will with us shortly. Today's show is titled Connecting the Dots. I'd like for us to join the dots on the overall climate and extinction crisis and make the point that nothing happens in isolation. It might seem obvious, but when we read articles about the cryosphere disappearing and there's no mention of the loss of habitat, it seems we need to state the obvious. Are you there, Guy? Okay, I'll carry on and hopefully God will be with us shortly. As always, it's a call-in show. US inmates can call 8888-744-888 and overseas callers can dial 00160-556-25119. If listeners miss those numbers, they are on a post at the top of my Facebook wall or at the PRN website. Looks like we're having trouble with the signal. How are we going there? Studio, can you hear me? Okay, I'll carry on. Hopefully God will be with us uh, before too long. On the 20th of March, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation published an article titled Shark Bay Seagrass, Seagrass Loss During Ocean Heat Wave released up to 9 million tonnes of CO2, the scientists say. The seagrass meadows are known as blue carbon ecosystems because they store CO2 in their roots. This is the equivalent to the annual output of around 800,000 homes, two coal-fired power plants, and even 1,600,000 cars. So as our oceans are dying... What we're, what we're finding is that all of the carbon that's being stored in the oceans is being released back into the atmosphere. Okay, Anthony, we have a caller. Anthony, would you like to say something? Yeah, is that you, Kevin? Yes, hi, Anthony, hi. Great, how are you, Kevin? I'm well, thank you. Well, I appreciate what you and Guy do. I think people need to be aware of what's going on on the planet, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Hi, Anthony, how are you? Did you hear me, Kevin? Yeah, you go ahead, mate, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate those words. Thank you very much. It's a, a thankless task as a general rule. Well, there was a couple things I wanted to talk to you guys about today. I know Guy's not on the line yet. You go ahead. Okay. Um, you don't know, uh, here in the States, we're having a lot of uh, northeast uh, snow. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts on the uh, Yankees home opener being canceled yesterday due to snow. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that meandering jet stream for you. You know, this is another, just another indication of how much trouble we're in, is that uh, we've ch changed the jet streams as the polar ice disappears, and all of that polar weather is coming down into the continental US, giving the deniers an opportunity to say, oh, things are getting um, colder, not warmer. But, you know, that, a, a very superficial search of what's going on will explain to anyone who's genuinely interested that... Um, it's not getting colder. It's only going to get warmer. Yeah, I was watching the Weather Channel today, and there was 75 million people on alert for weather, um, ranging from Texas up to the Ohio Valley and east and in Minneapolis, just everywhere. So, 
And all that's happening when we're about 1.75 above C above above baseline, and um, 2C was supposed to be a a safe uh, border for us to be able to stay within. Obviously, 2C wasn't safe. One and a half C isn't safe. And if you go back to the early days, if you go back to the early days of climate change, we were told that uh, 0.5 C was the limit that we should stay within. So they just keep moving the goalposts. Fortunately, we have Guy McPherson back with us. Hi, Guy, how are you? Kevin, good, thanks. How about you, yourself, mate? I'm living the good life on Rakino Island, except for one disaster, one climate change disaster that's unfolding live in front of my face and my, my neighbours in the Hauraki Gulf, is that we are having little, little blue-eyed penguins washing up on our beaches dead. Those penguins nest around our island. Sometimes they can climb 100 metres up a cliff to uh, make their nest and have their chicks. And there's this tragedy going on where everyone on the island is posting photos on their Facebook pages and on our Facebook group about penguins drifting up on the beach dead. So, you know, the sixth grade extinction is unfolding live and direct at my doorstep. Well, that's horrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, sort of in a way that leads to one of the subjects that I think that we should talk about, and that's grief and how we deal with it. Um, I think we're all we're all grieving, and some people are grieving more and more uh, obviously or more publicly than others. But the reality is that anyone who knows how bad the the situation is is grieving. And I think uh, talking about how we're going to deal with our grief as this unfolds is a really important part of this conversation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think there's a spectrum here, all the way from the sociopaths who couldn't care less and are not grieving at all. They're just counting the digits in their bank accounts. All the way to people who are extremely empathetic and empathic. People who are capable of actually putting themselves into the shoes of others and even including non-human others. So there's certainly is a broad spectrum there. And I'm fortunate to be surrounded by people who are at the latter end of the spectrum who actually care about the living planet. That's the good news. The bad news is we all care about the living planet. So it's it's a tough place to be. Yeah, that uh, reminds me of that famous quote from uh, Aldo Leopold. Uh, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives in a world of wounds. Yes, one is forced to live alone in a world of wounds by accepting what's going on with respect to the environment. We're in the same place as Aldo Leopold, who was, of course, the great American conservation biologist, one of the early forest rangers in the newly created forest service within the United States government who spent most of his time in Arizona, New Mexico, and at the shack in Wisconsin. So he split his time between the southwestern United States, initially before those states were states, when they were territories, and later after they achieved statehood. So a, a great conservationist who didn't need books. He needed only his own eyes to reach an understanding of what was happening to the world around him. This, that um, leads me to something that I would like to talk about, which is um, field researchers rather than modelers. In, in, in the old days, before the internet became so dominant in all of our cultures, most scientific research was done in the field. Since the internet's come along, a whole lot of, has more is being done online, and all the investment is going into, into modeling. And I think it's a real, a real danger that we are not having the same number of scientists and entomologists out in the field studying. Yeah. In our last discussion, we talked about, um, Paul Ehrlich's paper with the uh, title of Biological Annihilation Unfolding. And that was based a lot on the collapse of the flying insect populations in Germany. Since that time, Similar studies have come out saying exactly the same thing is happening in France and exactly the same thing is happening 
in Australia. And we know with habitat being lost in, in uh, the tropical forests of South America, the same thing's happening there. And yet there's very little public discussion in the mass media about the fact that this catastrophe is unfolding. And it's as if, oh, it's just bugs. You know, what does it matter? And people don't seem to be able to join the dots about how every single one of these things is interlinked and how critical it is to deal with each and every one of them as they come up. And of course, we're not doing, we're not dealing with it in any way, shape or form. You know, you bring up two important points. The notion that field biologists, people that actually spend their time off the sidewalks, out of their offices, might have something to say about what's going on in the world. And this is the double-edged sword of big data, of the ability to use computational infrastructure, which keeps doubling every 18 months or so, consistent with Moore's Law. And, and this is a double-edged sword. Suddenly we have the ability to synthesize and integrate and analyze data in ways that we're never capable of doing before, of taking data that were collected over spans of years or decades and mashing them into computers and, and seemingly making magic happen. The downside of that is it's a lot more expensive to go out of the doors and make the field observations than it is to crunch the numbers. And so, unfortunately, the money has gone most recently into crunching the numbers. A, a trend that I see has been accelerated and I suspect will continue to accelerate for as long as we have here on planet Earth. And the, 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 the second face of that double-edged coin is that we have sort of lost sight of what's going on in the real world and have given our lives over to the modelers and the number crunchers. And the, the people who are actually doing the field work are not viewed as being the heroes of the environmental movement that they actually are. You know, people who spend an entire career in the field, like Paul Ehrlich, are to be applauded. And you look at the work he has done along with his graduate students and his postdocs, and it's remarkable what, what has transpired under his tutelage over the course of the last, really, 60 years. And here's a guy who's actually in tune with the world, and most notably with the insects, the, the butterflies, in particular places where he's conducted his field research. That's amazing and undervalued by this society, the society that values video games over practical experiences of walking in the woods. So, you know, I don't see this turning around. It's a, it's a choice we made a long time ago and we continually give ourselves over to the technological side of relevant issues rather than the real world being present in nature side. And that's tough. I don't think there's any way around, around stating it in that bold uh, manner and concluding that, I mean, if I, was a, if I was a millennial, if I was 10 or 15 or 30 years old and had never been encouraged to go outside because there's all this constant stimulation coming at me through the computers, through the phones, through every imaginable digital device, of course I would have done what everybody else did. And that's downside, one of the many downsides to internet mania, to an internet world. Yeah, like everything, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. In one of um, Paul Ehrlich's presentations, I, I remember him referring to blizzards of moths. When, when you and I were young, you know, we're only in our um, late 50s, and when we, you and I were young, we we would see, if you sat around a fire, a campfire at night, the fire would attract uh, bugs from everywhere. If you drove down a road that had a street light, you would see bugs everywhere. One of the problems that our young people have is that they have never seen blizzards of moths, so they don't know what we've lost. Unless you and I talk about it and bring it to their attention, you're not going to know about these things. You know, the phrase, like moths to a flame, or like moths to a fire, 
is completely lost on young people because they've never been outside. And even if they have, they haven't seen a hell of a lot of bots, have they? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's an incredible situation to be in for you and I and our community to be bearing witness to what is so patently a collapse. And because the media have so poor, have failed so miserably in talking about how bad the situation is, most people are completely oblivious to it. It's extraordinary. I think we have to keep in mind that the goal of the corporate media is not to inform, it's to make money for a few people. It's to supply the jobs for a whole bunch of people and to make money, a lot of money, for relatively few people. So let's not lose sight of the goal of the corporate media. You know, the phrase, qui bono, comes to mind. Who benefits? Well, who benefits from a media that is failing to report anything of any great significance and instead is focused on reporting nonsensical, irrelevant distractions? So, you know, it's, 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 it shouldn't be a big surprise that we're that we are in the exact situation that we're in. Uh, how can anybody be amazed about this? Yeah, that's exactly right. But there, there are a few people up at the top of the food chain that are prepared to talk about it. And because they're so high up, he, um, this particular one got, got a mention. Um, I'm, uh, quite, you, you quote uh, President Ninisto, I hope I uh, pronounced his name right, from Finland, where he said in an article in Finland today, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the world. Well, you would think that when you've got a, a president of a nation talking about that, and it's so obvious that what the cryosphere is going away, um, how can we not be having a, a conversation about extinction? And it's it's almost like we're, um, we're the, the bad guys because we keep bringing up such a negative subject. You're absolutely right. Uh, the president of Finland, who's last name I won't even try to pronounce, so I wouldn't know where to begin, has been going around the globe and saying the same thing repeatedly. If we lose the Arctic, we lose the world, we lose the globe. And I'm, I'm certain that what he means by that is if we lose the ice covering the Arctic Ocean, then we lose habitat for humans on Earth. And that's, that should come as no big surprise to anybody who understands that the Arctic is the planet's air conditioner. What stays in the Arctic doesn't stay. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And what's happening in the Arctic right now is occurring actually slower than expected by the referee journal literature. A, a paper in the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences projected an ice-free or nearly ice-free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. Well, here we are, 2018. It would surprise me very much if that didn't, if that if we didn't get the ice-free Arctic this year. But it's two years later than I thought it would be, given the conservative nature of the referee journal literature. So it's, you, you know, and, and this is not the kind of information you and I like to present. It's not like we're making a lot of money or ensuring ourselves a lot of status by talking about the most dire consequences of ongoing phenomena. No, that's not the case at all. But when you know you frequently use your skipper of the ship analogy and i talk about the medical doctor who we expect to provide relevant information to the patient well we're we're beyond stage 4 cancer at this point we're over the cliff and why the coyote is spinning on his legs and for the most part he just hasn't looked down yet well you and i have looked down and we see that what what awaits us is not good news and it's tough to report it. We don't like to report it, but we feel a sense of obligation about it. And that the corporate media and so few others are reporting us, reporting ongoing catastrophes makes us look like nutcases. And I've been called that and far worse by people who don't understand the scientific phenomena that are surrounding us right now. Yeah. But it, it's, it's extraordinary the uh, cognitive dissonance that goes with this story right across the whole spectrum. Further to the things that you said about the Arctic, and you know, the, there's an, an expression what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. 
there's two two aspects of that that I'd like to address. One of them is that when we lose the sea ice, we lose the algae that forms under the sea ice, and that is the food that feeds the krill. So one of the fundamental building blocks of the marine food web is going to be decimated by the loss of the of the sea ice. What are people talking about that? Almost nothing. But on the other spectrum from that, on the 15th of March, Damien Carrington published an article in The Guardian titled Air Apocalypse, Smog Events in China Linked to Melting Ice, Research Reveals, and More Destabilizing of the Jet Stream. So that we just haven't lost the, the ice for our cocktails. What we've done is we've lost the, we're losing the ice that is affecting the smog levels in China and destabilizing the jet stream across the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. How can people not be completely and utterly freaked out by this? Because cognitive dissonance has been entrained into them essentially since birth. It's all going to work out fine, Kevin. How many times have you heard that? Somebody has got this under control. How many times have you heard that? And I don't think anybody has anything under control at this point. I think we're deluding ourselves, and most of us prefer delusion, to be honest. Compared to the dire outcome that we foresee, delusion is quite riveting. I wish I could spend more of my time there. The whole culture is uh, is um, predated on, on a white knight coming to the rescue. So some people think that a white knight will appear. Some people think a sil silver bullet will appear or that technology will save us. And it's technology that dug us into this hole. And uh, my fear going forward is that the psychopaths that we talked about earlier will go for um, extraordinary geoengineering uh, solutions that even the, you know you quoted often that the G referee general literature says that the, the, that geoengineering won't work and will probably make it worse. So I, ca I can't help but think that the disaster capitalists, will, while you and I are having this conversation, are coming up with geoengineering plans to try and mitigate or slow down the Armageddon. And I just think we, I can see them digging us into a deeper hole. Absolutely. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And we've never been in more desperate straits in terms of our, in terms of habitat for our species. You know, when a political figure, such as the president of Finland, goes traveling around the globe, telling people that if we lose the Arctic, we lose the globe, telling people that we're on the verge of loss of habitat for our species, telling people that we're on the edge of extinction. Well, that certainly sounds desperate to me. So I suspect anybody who's paying any attention, and there must be a lot of people who are paying attention at the highest levels of various governments, then of course they're going to try something. After all, it's part of this culture. You know, winners never quit, and quitters never win. How many times have we heard that? And it's only the losers that quit. So I've, I've no doubt that there will be desperate measures that will attempt to overcome the moving ship that is already at top speed and is an inch from the iceberg. I have no doubt that there will be attempts to try to stop that incredible disaster from becoming apparent. But will it work? It's hard for me to imagine that it would. Let's take the Arctic ice again as an example. And it, it's importance. You know, for three months of winter in the northern hemisphere, from late December until late March, it was dark in the Arctic. It was not just dusk, it was dark, as in dark as the night sky. And the ice did not significantly accumulate during that three month period of time. Usually, that's the period of refreezing of the Arctic ice, and the amount of refreezing that occurs is extraordinary, except this year it didn't happen. From late December until late last month, there was no significant accumulation of Arctic ice volume or of aerial extent. Well, if that doesn't do it, then what will? If that isn't enough to 
refreeze the ice on the Arctic Ocean to provide the white night that we've been looking for, then what's going to do it? I don't think that geoengineering during the spring, summer, and fall is going to do any good if if the absolute dark night sky doesn't allow for refreezing of ice in the Arctic Ocean. Do you think that's going to happen during the summertime? Seems unlikely to me. No matter how many particles we put up in space to try to prevent incoming radiation. So I think we're screwed, Kevin. I think that's the bottom line here. And to quote the age-old expression that you and I use frequently, sooner than expected or faster than expected. I think we're right on the we're right on the edge of closing the door here and nobody has their foot in the way. I'll give you an example of how screwed we are. The Trump regime has quietly named Susan Coombs an outspoken foe of endangered species and a climate change denier as acting secretary for fish, wildlife and parks. Just digest that for a second. The gatekeeper is a denier. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, that Trump is the epitome of the clown show at this point. I don't, you know, I, I don't think he's in charge of much. I think he's a really interesting distraction for the masses. I think that the whole administration has gone gonzo and is out of control. And maybe that's his whole job at this point. Maybe appointing these crazy people and, and distracting people who are actually interested, people who are actually informed about the catastrophe underway. Maybe that's the whole point. I don't know because I'm not in a position to know. But, geez, if I was in charge of keeping the people of the United States distracted, I don't think I could do any better than Trump, than a, than a clown-like character who emerges onto the scene knowing relatively little about government operations and suddenly having his fingers on the proverbial buttons. And, geez, what, what better way to continue uh, and di continue distracting an eternally distracted group of 300 million people? Your country has a history of patsies or fall guys. The famous one was the gentleman who got blamed with shooting JFK when when there's not a sniper on the planet could have pulled off the shot that that guy who had no formal or real training and didn't even have a real rifle that could have in any way, shape or form pulled that off. Uh, he, he was the patsy who took the blame for shooting JFK. I think in a way, um, Trump has been set up as being the fall guy. So he'll do everything badly and everyone will be able to blame Trump. Whereas the reality is all of this was set in stone a very, very long time ago. It absolutely was. You know, when you look just at the the single factor of latent heat and apply that to ice in the Arctic Ocean, you see that what has been going on for a long time has locked into place what happens in the near future. If you have the Titanic cruising out over the ocean and nobody notices until you're 10 feet from the ice of the glacier, of the iceberg, and then finally somebody says, glacier ahead when you're one inch away, it doesn't do any good. You can yell all you want. You know, I feel like at this point, we're playing the role of the ship captain, points out that we've already hit the, the iceberg, that the ship is going down, and we're trying to remind people what to do with their lives about it. What do you do now? You're gonna die, folks. The ship is going down, there are no life rafts. What are you going to do? Are you going to spend your incredibly valuable time, now that you recognize it's valuable, are you going to spend it with the, with the one you love who's down on the berth below deck? Are you going to dance? Are you going to go to the bar in the Titanic? Are you going to join the band? I mean, those are basically the choices we have at this point. We can join the band. <clears throat> we can dance. We can spend the time with those we love. But time is short. 
how are we going to do that? How do we make those choices? I feel like we're the only ones sort of among the very few who are telling people that time is indeed short. We don't know exactly how short, just as when the Titanic hits the iceberg, you don't know exactly how long it's going to be before it goes underwater and takes everybody with it. But we know it's short. It isn't long. I found learning this information very liberating. It's liberated me from a whole lot of things that I uh, was locked into before I realized that the situation was so dark, dire and there's so much inertia in the system. Uh, we have a caller. Gaia, how are you, Gaia? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Go ahead. Hey, things are worse than we think. We not only, you know, with... <laughs> We're looking at the ice in the Arctic. The dark okay. for our minds. Okay, the ice in the Arctic. But what about the um, the fundamentals of our economic, global economic uh, crash we're about to have? You know, that's gonna we're we'll lose the Deming at the same time we're gonna lose the ice. You know, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And I've been reading quite a bit, primarily at a website comprised of climate deniers called Zero Hedge that does a great job with financial issues. And, you know, you look at the likes of David Stockholm, for example, and Paul Craig Roberts, these are people who have been on the inside and they know what's going on. And, and they're all saying that, you know, we're, we're days or weeks away from an enormous financial crash that will make the Great Depression look like a walk in the park, look like a, not just a walk in the park, a party in the park. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Gaio, given the dire straits with respect to the climate situation and civilization as a heat engine that is powering civilization, it looks like we're right on the verge of shutting off the heat engine and heating up the planet even faster. Yeah, it's a dueling train wreck situation. For those of our listeners who didn't understand what Gaio meant when he meant global dimming, global dimming is the effect of that all of our pollution that we've emitted into the atmosphere it has a cooling effect on the planet. When 9-11 happened and uh, three buildings mysteriously fell over in New York, all the planes were grounded for a week and the global mean temperature had a spike because all of that dimming fell out of the air. Well, when in 2008, when the GFC uh, happened and the global economy tanked, all the shipping around the planet was laid out. You know, there were amazing pictures of Singapore Harbour with uh, thousands and thousands of freighters uh, banged up on, on anchors waiting for um, freight. Well, a statistic that will blow you all away is that 16 of the most polluting ships on the planet emit more carbon and sulfur pollution into the atmosphere in particular than the entire world's private vehicle fleet. Just think about that for a moment. Even if just those ships stop for a week or two, it will have a definitive effect on the global mean temperature. That's how tenuous our situation is. And then try to tell me that your electric car is going to make the big difference you think it will. Yeah, that's just delusion. There was a blogger that we all used to follow years ago named Robert Scribbler. And he, he was, at the time, one of the world's leading um, climate bloggers. And he was dedicated, coming up with lots of great information. And then in the last few years, he's became a, an electric vehicle addict. And, you know, I can't understand how someone could have learned so much and have failed to have read um, Tim Garrett's seminal paper about industrial civilization being a heat engine. Doesn't matter what we well, power with people. I'm sorry, I've got the bad news for you. All the solar panels in the world aren't going to dig us out of this hole. Well, yeah, and I, I attribute this at least in part to the fact that Mr. Fanny, that's his real name, not Scribbler, he he actually writes fantasy for money. So he writes romantic fantasy novels. That's how he makes his his bling every month. So it's not that big a stretch from there to fixing climate crisis, is it? <laughs> You've got to laugh at this situation, or else you just spend your whole time crying. Gaio, do you have a further comment for us? Nope. Seems like he's gone. Okay. Um, okay. And he's gone. 
Okay, cool. Um, when, when we talk about uh, the situation and what mitigation is being uh, taking place around the planet, I'd like to call attention to a March 22 Reuters article titled Global Carbon Emissions Hit Record High in 2017. We poured another 32.5 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere and the oceans. 32.5 billion tons of carbon. That's our new record. Congratulations, Sapiens. Yay. Good thing we're putting some thing up there or we'd be in real trouble. <laughs> go, on, you know, uh, go, this on. Is, go on. This is something that Edward Abbey, the desert anarchist who lived in Tucson, Arizona, most of his adult life, pointed out that I think is relevant here. He was... He was calling for and promoting the collapse of industrial civilization in the 1970s with his writings. And one of the things he wrote was that civilization, like an airplane in flight, remains aloft only as it is moving forward. In other words, he recognized then in the 1970s that we are part of a must-go-faster society. And if we don't go faster, we crash. Those are the options. And that's been the case with every civilization so far. They either pick up the pace, pick up the pace, pick up the pace forever, and of course forever is a long time, but or they completely collapse. They 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 hit the the vanishing point at which you can't go faster anymore because they run out of fuel, they run out of feedstock, and then bam, they hit the wall. And there's case after case of civilizations doing this, and we think, against all that evidence, that it doesn't apply to us. On, on that same vein, uh, I remember an amazing quote from the late, great Michael C. Rupert, where Mike used to say, unless you change the way money works, you change nothing. And I think that really is indicative of the situation we're in, where the liberals around the planet are coming up with these pie-in-the-sky pseudo-solutions like electric vehicles, and electrification, solar panels, wind power, all of those things, and they're ignoring the fact that that industrial civilization is a heat engine and that that money controls the whole planet and everything that is taking place on it. I think I think there's an insanity issue that's going down here where the, the system is insane. Infinite growth on a finite planet is an insane concept. And people are trying to reform the insanity rather than cure it. Our only option before we knew about global dimming was to pull down industrial civilization to spare us. Now we know that isn't going to happen. The reality is we are over the cliff and in the free fall stage into the abyss and no one wants to admit it. And I, just recently I've been asked if I would go and speak at a deep green school on the outskirts of Auckland where these wonderful people have set up in an alternative school where a lot of the academia is not being taught. They teach them basic academia, but they teach them survival, and they teach them how to grow and cook and fix and repair. And I think it's courageous that those, that, that school has asked someone like me to go and speak there, because as a general rule, people want you and I shut up. They don't want to hear about us. No, you're absolutely right. And it's, it, I, I couldn't agree more. It's courageous for the leaders of the school to bring you in. Because people don't want to hear about this. If people don't want to hear about anything that might threaten their privilege. And that, for the most part, is what we're talking about. When you talk about those liberals who, or progressives who think we're going to fix things with electric cars or electrifying the transportation system or blah, blah, blah. This this is another form of denial, another form of delusion. It's, it's bargaining our way out of a situation. Well, nature doesn't bargain. Nature doesn't negotiate. Nature's in charge here. We are not in charge. Let's first admit that, and that that's always been the case, and perhaps live accordingly, live with the, with gratitude for what we have instead of constantly seeking and expecting more more, always more. That's a start. You know, there's so many places to go from here with respect to the emotional response, N never mind the societal response to the dire streets we're in. And where to begin? For me, at least, 
started a long time ago, and it primarily now focuses on the individuals that I find myself with on a daily basis. So I'm surrounded by wonderful people who and who, who actually get it. We don't, we don't have to have this conversation every day. And there are people who are living accordingly. They're, they're living with a sense of urgency, with the understanding that, as Homer said in the Iliad, any moment might be our last. So that has been, as you indicated, liberating for a lot of people and affirmative in terms of life. It's an affirmation of the importance of our lives, insignificant though they may be in the grand scheme of things. But still they matter to us and the relatively few people who we encounter on a daily basis. I would like to make a, a, an analogy that I use often about liberals. I, I often say that we're in our 1937, 38, 39 moment in Europe. In that time in Europe, liberals sat back and watched the re-rise of fascism. And it came to power because they were all too comfortable. They weren't drinking lattes at the time, but they were drinking piano and different other things. And, and they stood by and they watched fascism come to power. And six brutal years later, 60 million people were dead. But a, a, a death toll that never gets talked about in the Second World War is the biological annihilation that took place when all of those wars were being fought. And that's the same thing that's happening now, is that the biological annihilation is taking place. And the liberals who come from the circles that you and I have often mixed in in the past, they don't want to hear you and me talking about things like this because it will disturb their night at the cafe. Yeah, you're right. You know, and there's a woman, Mich Michelle, who moved here from the United States on January 1st of this year. So she's been here for just a little over three months. And she is... Um, setting up an outpost for her family um, here in Belize. And I'd like to have her comment on why she came here, not going into a lot of the history, but why here, why now? Why don't you just, why didn't you just stay in the United States where I hear things are getting better every single day? <laughs> why'd you come here, Michelle? If you could just provide a brief comment. Um. Well, I couldn't get out of the U.S. fast enough. Um, I was surrounded by crazy. And I came to Belize because I figured if you are going to watch the world burn, you may as well do it in paradise. That's a great answer. Thank you. you sure. to... Evan, would you like to comment on that? That is absolutely beautiful. And, and as a result of me learning about your work, and then becoming more involved in it, and you and I becoming involved online, and then you came to New Zealand two times. One of the, the big payoffs for me about this whole thing is that you set me free from those chains. I moved down onto a small island in the Hauraki Gulf. I, I live in paradise. The paradise is unfolding before my eyes, as I said before, about our... Blue, blue, uh, little blue penguins dying and being decimated all around the coast. But I'm living the life I'm living as a result of what you have taught. So I owe you. I don't feel bad about the fact that you've w wised me up and and brought to my attention how, how dire the situation is. I, I want to no, qualify yeah. that a little bit by, by pointing out, yes, I do know that I'm privileged. I'm a white male privilege, and I, and I can do what I'm doing. But if anybody can go out early in the morning and watch the sunrise, anyone can go and watch the sunset. There are two glorious things happening everywhere on the planet every day that you can immerse yourself in if you want to. It does, you don't have to be in the middle of the, of the Amazon to enjoy a sunrise or a sunset. That's right. I have a, another woman who's here visiting. She's been here for about a week, also from the United States. And I've asked her to provide a little commentary as well about what it's like just visiting the paradise we call Belize. So, Marilyn, can you hit us with a couple of words? I'm going to hit you with a few words. Um, I came to visit my 
my dear friend Pauline, we met, as she says, 13 years ago in landscape design school. And we've communicated ever since as friends. And I have not followed um, Guy's philosophies. But again, I'm here in Belize visiting. And as I'm here having lunch with Pauline and Guy and Michelle, and I'm hearing the names of people that I have read in my youth when, when my ecology awareness was developing and my philosophies of what life on this planet should be. It makes me weep because there's nothing we can do. I mean, some of us acknowledge the inevitable, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it's almost every man for himself and our families and our beloveds. And um, I have, I leave the United States on a regular basis in the winter for, for medical reasons as well as seasonal reasons. Um, I spend my winters in Costa Rica, which is a very different country. But in terms of, of being away from the madness that is the United States, it's, I just hate to say it's always good to be gone from there. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. And you can tell this is a very emotional experience for Marilyn, who, who mentioned her friend Pauline. Pauline, that's sometime co-host or guest host on this show, Pauline Schneider. And it's just another example of the, the beautiful nature of the people who come to visit and the experiences they have, life-changing experiences, much as you described earlier, Kevin based on your interactions with me and coming to grips with my message. So this is not all doom and gloom. There's there's a lot of doom, but there's a lot of happiness to go along with that too. A lot of uh, coming to grips with the reality of the short and privileged nature of our lives that we get to be here at this time in history is just absolutely remarkable. I think everybody who ultimately takes in fully takes in my message and increasingly your message, Kevin, is better for it, is less cynical, less bitter, more grateful for the lives that they have had here on this most amazing of planets. We cannot fix this predicament, but what we can do is we can create temporary oasis and sanctuaries where we can comfort each other and help each other ride out the perfect storm. I think that we should be doing that. We should be forming tight little tribes with people that we love and who we trust, and we should be making the most of every day. You've done that. I'm attempting to do that. And I'm not really into giving advice to people, but I, I really do believe that we need to live every day in the present, make the most of it, share what we can. And I, one of the things I want to uh, say as we come, we're getting a little closer to the end of the show, is I, I don't want to be the last generation of elder to lie to the last generation of youth. Our, our youth have had everything robbed from everything, lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. I am not going to lie to those people as I leave, as I leave them with the plane. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great statement and a great testimony of Kevin. And I was lied to. Almost everybody is lied to, if not overtly, by the culture, by the society, then covertly, with the assumptions built in. The latest University of Michigan survey found that for the first time in the 60 years of the survey, young people see a far darker future than their elders. It's the first time ever. And people under the age of 35 recognize that people their parents' age had the good old days, and they aren't going to have that situation. This is based on the on economics, not based on abrupt climate change that, of course, the University of Michigan will 
not acknowledge. But it's telling that young people know that they've been misled about the entire global situation. So good for them for figuring it out, bad for them in terms of the brevity with which they'll have to come to grips with the situation. That, that level of awakening, I think, is, is simmering just below the surface, like a pot of water just about to boil. You can stand and watch a pot on the stove and, it, and nothing happens, and then in the last few seconds, it bursts into life. And it's the same with ice when it melts. If you've got an ice cube in a glass, as long as there's a little bit of ice in there, the water is at zero, at, um, zero or minus uh, temperature, and then quickly that, that temperature builds up. I had a couple here walked into my house the other day, and I still have on my front door the poster from our 2016 climate change tour around New Zealand. And I keep that there as a memento of my friendship with you and the work that we did, that we tried to do. And these people looked at it, and they said, they seen the, the, the poster, and um, they said, oh, yeah, I remember you doing that tour. And uh, I said, yeah, that, that guy McPherson, he thinks we're going extinct and soon. And these two people who have pretty much no involvement at any serious level about the uh, uh, crisis, they looked back at me and said, of course we're going extinct. They, they didn't need any, I didn't have to sell anything to them. They just know in their gut that they're going extinct, that we're going extinct. And I think most people do. And the question is, how long will it be? And this is why that the, the narrative has been created around how bad it will be in 2100 or how bad it will be in 2050. If you go down on my beach and do a post-mortem on the dead little blue penguins on my beach, they will tell you that the extinction event is underway now. Absolutely. In fact, there are thousands of those little blue penguins who can't tell you that because it already happened to them. It already took their lives. And that's increasingly the situation for humans on Earth. We don't have long, and there's a lot of people who, were they still able, would tell us that we don't have long. Well, that leads me to a segue as we come to the end about tipping points. Because you and I talk about the fact that this will unravel very quickly, and people are skeptical because the the momentum out there looks the same. You know, there are bad things happening, but, you know, it's the, the normal culture still happening. The power's on, the water's coming out of the tap, supermarkets are full. What I think that could happen any day from now on is we could have a major ecological event. Maybe that will be in September when the 50 gigaton burst of methane hypothesized by Shakova and Similitov, if that bursts out... Uh, Peter Wadham said in a recent uh, Extinction Radio interview that if we had that 50 gigaton burst, we would have a, a pretty much instantaneous 0.5C temperature spike on the planet. Well, that's a third. In, in a week, we could have one third of all the global warming take place. That could be a tipping point where everyone will immediately see that that the, the, the uh, dire straits that we're in and collapse could unfold very, very quickly after that. So I, I, I urge people to take that in mind that this cancer is metastasizing very quickly and it goes on and on and then one day it kills you. That's how I see it. this is going to unfold. And there's no guarantee it's going to wait till September, Kevin, given the fragile nature of the ice in the Arctic right now. It would not surprise me at all if we had an ice-free or nearly ice-free Arctic in July. And I'm not predicting that, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me, given the situation we find ourselves in right now. Oh, yeah, it's a good point. I'm th thank you for qualifying that, because uh, that's exactly true. Uh, the, we are a day-to-day -day proposition. There's no question about it, especially since the mistakes that have been made by the IPCC, where... They, they have gone along with the dominant culture telling us that 1.5 or 2C is a safe target for us to be aiming for, even though we're not even aiming for it. We're overshooting it at every, at every opportunity. I was, um, given Lister, uh, who's a 
a, a writer and teacher from the UK. He's working with a group of colleagues, a uh, lot of scientists, and they've, they've brought a, a document called the United Nations Talanoa Dialogue, uh, where that, and they are saying that, uh, 0.5 of a C, 0.5 C was the true safe range. We are already three to, we are already triple that. And we are racing off. It's just extraordinary that uh, it, the situation could be so extreme and the, the level of cognitive dissonance so obvious. Hey, we're coming to the end, Guy. I'd like you to sign off with the with, with your last words and also the final word on Nature Bat's last, please. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's been an honor to chat with you, as always. Thanks for my guests here at Table Rock Jungle Lodge in Western Belize for weighing in. And thanks to Marty behind the bar for keeping us all happy. I'd like to hit people to keep in mind that at the edge of extinction, and we're certainly there at the edge of extinction, only love remains. Nature bats last. Thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful day. That's almost 52 years so far. The world has become a worse and worse place. Every year we have polluted more water than the year before. Every year there's been less clean air than there was the year before that. Every year there are fewer, fewer species on the planet than the year before that. We're driving 200 species a day to extinction. We're about to see that turn around. The loving planet is about to make a comeback. And that's really, really good news. She bats last and she's coming out swinging. She bats last and she's just about taking all that she can take.